Uh, I'm going to give you a few things that I've worked with before. But I hope we can develop this into a conversation, which, after all, is what we're supposed to be doing, right, with, with our students. So um, let's start out with. I don't know how most of you probably heard of Paul O'Brien. He uh, writes about, he's been writing about pedagogy, and this is his kind of groundbreaking book that he wrote. <laughs> I like this quote because um, this is kind of the way I was taught in, in graduate school by our instructors in the writing program to, to teach, and they drew on his theories a lot. So his book is Pedagogy of the Oppressed. The teacher is no longer merely the one who teaches, but the one who himself is taught in dialogue with the students. Who in turn are being taught also teach. They become jointly responsible for the process of the child grow. I think this is really applicable to my field, to English, and it may not be as much so to other uh, disciplines, because you're teaching a lot more facts than what, what we are approaching here. In the classes. And I, I tell the students this that I want to hear from them because I learned from them. And it's really good to be able to get their, their uh, impressions. And true, some of them are off the wall with an invalid basis. <laughs> but you can use that as a learning tool also. I think. <clears throat> so um, I think that. Getting the students to participate really helps them to think things through and to think about to think about things critically and learn to argue effectively. And I tell them, I have no problem if they don't agree with me. Let's talk about it at the end. I get a lot of, uh, when it's successful, and we all know we have some classes that don't always, you can't get a lot of conversation going, but where I can get the conversation going between the students they do tend to have divergent views and they're willing to talk in between them. And we do it in a very civil manner. In fact, that is in my uh, syllabus. We need to agree that we can disagree. Very respectfully. So some of the things to consider, what are the physical considerations of trying to get your students involved? And one of the things that, um, I think is important is to walk around the room and I think most from what I've observed most of us do that there are times when when we stand behind the, the lectern or the desk but there's it's really recommended to get your students involved is to break that plane to to move into their space to get them to get them to talk and in group work I found one of the most effective ways to make sure they're not just gossiping about each other is to <clears throat> walk from group to group. My grad instructor, the grad of the director of the graduate program at Utah State that taught us the instructors of great students how to teach. She called it looming. She was really tall and she felt like if you were there, you know, that they would pay attention to what they're supposed to be doing. I find that you can get them to ask a question that can spur the discussion in their particular group. And once one group kind of gets involved and you get the other groups involved. I know that there's uh, different theories on how you form the group. Some instructors are very um, particular. They try to cross, put people in cross-disciplinary groups that sometimes are they uh, just let them form their own groups. I've done forming their own groups a lot. Sometimes I just make them count off. You get, you do get a different dynamic sometimes if you're not sitting with the people who they know because they're sitting with somebody across the room. The other thing I think it's important for uh, the instructor to to make eye contact. Very gently smile because you know what they do. But if you can be um, in, in their space a little bit, or you know, if you see them glance up at all, you can talk to them. 
And it's important that you listen to what they have to say and that you comment on it and you validate your opinion and lead them, if you need to, in two different directions. But you have to respect what they have to say. After all, you're forcing them to participate, really. So you have to respect what they say, I do. The other thing that I think is very difficult for us, and it's very difficult for me, so I think it is waiting for them to answer. We think we wait a long time. Studies have shown that most instructors wait one to two seconds. <laughs> Time passes fairly slowly when you're waiting for somebody to talk. So those are those are kind of considerations in physicality. Yes, I always feel if I'm waiting that I make them uncomfortable. Maybe they don't know the answer. Yeah. So I don't want to make them uncomfortable, but I may not be waiting longer. Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. It's hard to know exactly. I try to emphasize that I'm not asking for a specific answer, which is probably more true in my discipline than it is in some others. I told I, I'm not looking for a specific answer. Just tell me what what you're thinking or what your reaction is or what you what you know. Also, uh, we have to think about our questions. They need to be open ended and. These are examples of some of the critical, critical questions. I need to be more about it. <laughs> they, need, we need, they need to think about, we need to think about when we're writing these, these uh, questions or thinking about the questions, to use open-ended words to, these are called critical question verbs. They're used a lot in, in critical thinking literature. Asking them to contrast, to illustrate, to examine, to define, explain, <coughs> evaluate, compare. They're more open-ended. They're not something that can be answered simply. It takes a longer, a longer time, and it takes more thinking. So we use these types of things. And the reason that I think, um, the reason I think that that's important is they have to think. They can't just give you one little simple answer. So the other thing. This is, studies have shown that um, some of the things you can do, the open-ended questions, making the classroom a safe, safe place, that validates their, what they know, it validates their participation if you make it safe. And also, from the very beginning, from the very first day, if you can um, have this expectation, you let them know that they are expected to participate. Some of the things I've done, some of these things I haven't done, but I used to have, I haven't done this recently, but in a large composition class um, when I was at Eastern Kentucky, we played games and things like Jeopardy and Bingo, and that really gets them, you know, interacting with each other. They get very competitive. I also, in fact, in the and those classes often had them do their presentations, and they had to do it in the form of a game. They're very creative in the games they come up with. Something, but something much more uh, creative than Jeopardy and Bingo, which is what I usually rely on. <laughs> but um, the two things that I haven't used, but I've seen it in the literature, um, is that instead of just calling on Michael, or calling on Christy, everybody has a number and you roll the dice, and that's the person that has to answer that question. It's, I have not used it, but it's been reported to be very effective. You're trying to make this participation less icy, I guess you could say. They also uh, recommend, sometimes read, that uh, you can put their names on cards and shuffle the cards, and you can even have somebody else draw the cards. So they, it's not your fault, but your fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's somebody else's fault. So, it's called cold calling, just calling on people in the class. And sometimes you have to do that. I hate doing it. Sometimes you have to do it. <clears throat> but what I like to do is set them up with some type of pre-discussion activity. <coughs> and one of the ones that I used um, this year is what's called a pre reading activity. And the one I used was Lost at Sea. So the very first day of class, 
they're expecting to come pick up the civil disability. But he's he's dying because he doesn't understand how to survive in that temperature. I think the temperature was 32 bar or zero or something. The dog, however, knows how to survive. So I did use it. That was the second, that was the assignment for the next day of class was to read Jack London's development fire. So what Lost at Sea does, you have them put, uh, put them in, have them in groups, and they are given a scenario where their ship is sinking, and they're given uh, a lifeboat that has certain things in it. And you have them decide what they're going to do to survive. Are they going to, and the list of stuff in the, in the boat, I can't remember all of them, but it was like raincoats and water and canned tuna, and, you know, fishing hooks. There were all, there's a big list about um, probably 15, 20 items. So you ask them, what do they need to survive? They're not going to be rescued for about four or five days. They know that. They're in the North Sea. So they, it's cold, there's ice burning out, and they're in this little lifeboat with this material. And you have them work through that. It's intended to make them think about survival, which most of our kids have never had to deal with, and set them up to talk about how the male character in the Build a Fire didn't think through critically about what he needed to do. He assumed he knew everything already. It was pretty, it was pretty effective, it worked really well. The other one I read about and I did not use is um, the Soldier's Dilemma. It gives students an idea of what soldiers um, face in warfare. And the scenario is up during the Vietnam War, and you, may, you probably remember that there were a lot of um, bombs and stuff in the trails <coughs> and you couldn't really trust the Vietnamese you didn't know who was friendly and who was not. The soldier is told to go out on point to watch and if he sees any civilian he's to shoot that civilian. That's to protect the rest of the troop which is going down his path. So you, the, the solution they have to think about is what is the soldier going to do? He sees this woman who looks perfectly innocent but again, we don't know. When you're in Vietnam, women were used as decoys a lot. <coughs> what does he do? Trying to get the, the students to think about a moral dilemma. Do you follow orders? You're in the service. You're supposed to follow orders no, way, no matter what. Do you, can you really kill this woman? It's recommended to work with Ernest Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms, which is a second, second or first world war in Vietnam. Uh, first, it's the first one. That's first. And Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried, which takes place during Vietnam. It's a book, but there's a short story that's anthologized all the time. So you're kind of giving them something to think about before they read the material, which you can use as a springboard for the discussion, which is usually the next day. There's other, other things, another example that you can use is to give them a problem-based question. Let's say they're reading Romeo and Juliet in the Shakespeare class. You ask them, how do we define true love? And again, almost all of these I do in a, in a group, but you can do it individually. You have to be a, a pre-writing of the class. <coughs> so after they've defined true love, based on your definition, how do you know if Romeo's in love? Or if any adolescent is in love? How many of our students think they're in love? You know? <laughs> and then they never see that person again. <laughs> so it's just, it brings it, there's not an easy answer. It also brings it to them personally. But you need them to get personally involved. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, uh, suggested as an example is like with the scarlet letter. As literature people, we love to talk about the symbolism and the motifs and everything in the, in the literature. And in our school, we have very few classes that are 100% English majors. 
English majors are probably the only ones that really care about motifs. The simplicity. So you've got, what, 80% of the class is other than someone's. How do you connect? How do they connect to it? If you know the Scarlet Letter, you know she's shunned you because she had adultery. She had sex with you. <coughs> um, you can ask something like, why didn't she Why did she stay? She could just leave. She would go to another city. Why didn't she do that? Get them to think about it. So some of the things that I've done to get them to thinking about the text before we come to class. Um, I do this especially when I'm doing the novel, novel class, is have them make reflections on the novel before they come to class. And I usually give them specific instructions on how they want to look at format their reflection. I, do, I start the class sometimes with group work and give each group a different question and then have them report back and start the conversation with the rest of the groups. You can also start, um, you can do journaling, and I've got something I want to show you about that in a minute. <coughs> you also can do, there's some writing prompts. You can get them to think about connection they made with the, with the literature. This is um, because I teach mostly 20th and 21st century lit, it's easier usually for me to connect with that than it is with Bayola, for instance. Um, questions they could uh, ask, <coughs> things they don't understand. Something that, if you do it after the class discussion, you can have them talk about something they, that was said in class that gave me something to think about. Those are just suggestions. But you see what kind of questions we're talking about. The uh, this is a technique I just heard about. How to, I mean, I knew this is another form of journal, but um, <clears throat> it's a specific way to do it. Kind of hand it. yourself in a way because it's really a series of conversations with the text that they read. And they are too, if you look at the, this is actually the instruction sheet that I give out to the students. And it talks about what they need to do. Basically, I have them pick, depending on the time in the class, two to three quotes mm -hmm. from the text that we're talking about. And then write a response to it. And the purpose, I only give this out the first time I do it, is just to show them how they can do it. After that, they can do it as a paper. So what they do is on this side of the, of the paper, they quote the text. Put the page number down so when we come back and talk about it, we can all find it. And then over here, they do their response. And some of the ways they respond is to question something in it, to make a connection to it, to clarify a point, if they get confused, so they want to clarify a little bit, that disturb them, to reflect or to evaluate. And I told them to use passages that seem very significant to them. Now sometimes they pick out a lot of the same ones, but sometimes they there'll be different ones for everyone in the class. So that really works well. Significant, powerful, thought provoking, or something that puzzled them and disturbed them. Then they, um, then we, I get plenty of time to do this. Because it's possible. 
possible, of course, that some of the did not actually read the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it happens to be an extended time. Yes, a little extra time. I only really used this this year, this particular method. And it's really working well. I don't do it all the time. I do it maybe once every week or two. But they know, I, I think most of the students in class are actually reading. Between the quizzes and this, and, you know, the uh, response questions at the beginning, most of the, most of the students are reading. So it goes a little faster. But we get some really good questions. <coughs> and if people don't volunteer, I call them. They all, and that they know that they're going to have to participate. So when I, and I collect, <coughs> them, collect them the first time, and after afterwards. The ones times I've used it, I've collected it. And they're writing really interesting comments. They're really, even if they're not saying a lot of great things in the conversation, from their writing, they're getting more than, than just the conversation shows. So I think that's really, this is really wonderful. And I still put off the end of And I was going to try to find the source for you, but I didn't find it that source. So how do you enforce um, participation? I was taught that you should grade your participation, which I used to do. I don't do that anymore, but I brought you some um, suggestions on how to do participation, how to grade it. One of the, uh, one of the authors that I was looking at um, does a self-assessment. He has the students assess their own participation rate and defend it. So they check whether they contribute several times or once, or often, or occasionally, or rarely. And they grade themselves. But then they have to provide a rationale. Most, if they put down a B, then they have to say why they can participate. It's similar to one of the things I do with essays. I give them a writing rubric, and I have them grade their self, grade themselves, where they think they stand. And they amazingly underestimate the grade all this very time, which is kind of interesting. Not everybody, but the vast majority think they're worse than they are, which is kind of interesting. Please, well, you don't have to go back. The, um, then that form that is handed out where the student access, uh, does their own assessment, the instructor comments on that and points out why they're really in the C range rather than the B range or why they really are in the A range rather than the C range or whatever. So that it's, it, it's a battle on the participation between the student and <coughs> between the student and the faculty. There is, um, there are tons of rubrics out there. When I, I uh, put this into Google last night, there were 703,000 hits <laughs> from rubrics on one, one slide, just one quick glance. So this is another one, this is very simple. This is done by the instructor, evaluates the participation. <coughs> Evidence shows the preparation of the class is prepared notes and or recalls the readings without the use of the open text. So this is just a simple one. There are much more complicated ones, and I brought you one of those. This one um, I got from uh, the faculty focus. Mm -hmm. The faculty focus website. And this looks a lot like this is kind of the type of rubric I use for essays. There's a grade across the top, and you may have to meet these particular criteria. And it's described very um, 
pretty much in detail for what each one of the grades is. So you go from an A plus, which is actively supports, engages, and listens to peers. And if you in the D range, virtually no interaction with peers. So it, it grows down, and it's uh, pretty easy for you to understand. It's similar, like I said, it's super normally used for SS. It's a little more complicated, but I think it does a little more. This would work in an online class, too. As well. Yes. Creating yeah. discussion forms and things. It seems like it would be more helpful in that when you have yeah, that's no true. specific. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can I really look at what their comments are. I have an online discussion board member. Yeah. Do you want me to send it to you? I think I shared that a couple of years ago. <laughs> I don't remember exactly that. So, particip do great participation or not? There's a lot of varied opinions on that. Some studies show that it's very effective. Other studies show that it's really not. At this point, I'm not really great at participation. So, just, it's hard to great participation. You really have to keep kind of detailed records, I think, to be fair. I mean, you've got an impression, you know who talks most of the time. But um, I just think to be totally fair, it's a little more difficult. It requires better record for people. One thing I do is kind of combine attendance and participation. So that, like, let's say about a 15 day class, you know, a class that meets once a week. They, I would give them like 20 points for attendance and participation so that they get like one point for each of the classes and then the other five points are like my discretion. That's Do you know what I'm saying? And then that way, you know, they get a point for showing up and then the other five points I can kind of give them as. And you can kind of base it. Right, I can base that on overall, you know, when they were there, were they active <coughs> there and so on. And that, I've never had anyone question those those five, you know, how I distributed the points at the end. They know whether they were involved or not. Yeah, so. that's true. Chris? One of my, like, one of, one of my favorite professors had said this, I can't say that she used an actual rubric, but like you talked about setting an expectation that they participate in the beginning. And the first day of class, she said, the way that I'm going to judge participation is the last week of class, I'm going to turn my chair away from you, and you're going to have to speak. And if I can't identify you by your voice, then you failed. <laughs> See, she didn't actually ever do that. But she set up that, that expectation so the students knew that she needed to be able to recognize them just by their voice. And so I thought, it, like, she's, she's very blunt in the way that she, she made her observations, but that was probably the most actively engaged class of discussion that I've ever been in. Now, it might have been partly because we were doing Young Adult Lit, and a lot of people had some pretty strong opinions yeah. about the pieces we were reading, but I think it also went to the idea that they knew if you can't recognize, if she can't recognize your voice, then, then obviously you're, you're only contributing maybe once a week. Yeah. So. That's really great. I think that was very good. There's all kinds of things. I forgot to tell you that, um, just remember, is when we're talking about the physical part of participation. I think and we can't do it all the time. If your class is small enough, if you can put them in a circle, you get a lot more conversation with each other. Because they're they, it breaks that barrier. Now usually that means that you're sitting down in the circle so a lot so you can move around in their space. But there's something about that circle that facilitates conversation yeah, I think a lot of it, like you said, has to do with the fact that they can see people, so they also feel accountable to one another. And, and I like, just because I want to be able to write on the board, you know, instead of sitting down, I like a horseshoe, and then I have, like, the, like I have, they can still see everyone, but they can also see the board, too, so if, the, if I need to give notes, they can talk to those, too. That seems to work pretty well. That's a good idea. And you could do that with a larger group. She's not That was an active I've done No, I said, I told him that he was being validated. He was encouraging his questions. Oh, well. So, what's your favorite team for getting students involved? I always try to give them, I try to give them, if I, 
because I mostly teach math, when I am teaching like the connections class or I teach my strategic planning class for my undecided students, I'm really out of my comfort zone. Like, so this, that's why I really wanted to come to this because discussions are really my weak point. But I find if I have them come with, I give them an assignment to come prepared with a specific thing. Like when I talk um, connections with the Pink Solver book, whatever section they were supposed to have read, I would ask them to bring one sentence or one passage, you know, and just read it. They're going to read it to the class and then explain why they picked it. And I said, you could pick it because there was a word you didn't know. It. Or you could pick it because you liked the imagery, you know, they, and a lot of them did. The King Solver had so much good imagery, you know, a lot of them chose those kind of passages or, you know, they chose something because they grew up on a farm and they remember doing the sheep shearing or whatever, you know, I mean, it was but it at least gave us a starting point so that each student had one thing written down that they could say. See, I think that's so important is to have them and that way they already were, have connected to whatever yes. it is. So that they were prepared to it. Or I would say, like with my strategic planning class, I'll say, you know, come prepared next week with three things that you're really good at. <coughs> what are your strengths? What are you really good at? And then that's what we use to start start the discussion is if I, if I allow them to be super, especially as freshmen, I think, you know, with that first semester, they really need to be. Well, they're so afraid that they don't, they're, they're, they're thinking, you know, you can tell they're thinking, usually, but they're so afraid that they're going to say something mm -hmm. that you don't want to hear or it's wrong or, and they're not, they're scared of what you might think, but they're also scared of what you're so if you get them, sometimes you, I just, if nobody will say what they've said, I'll just say, read me what you wrote. Yeah. You know, and they'll read them. So that gets it. Right. That's, That's why I think if they can have some kind of a short writing, even if it's just bullet points or five <laughs> words, you know what I mean? That at least it gives them a, something to get started with when they come in, you know. And a lot of them are very informal in the classroom. And a lot of students, that makes them very uncomfortable because they want the rigidity and the, you know what I mean? And so when I'm just kind of all over the place, they, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not handle that. So I let them give, bring their own structure, you know. Let's see, because I don't have fun. <laughs> well, that's your, that's your street. <laughs> yeah, <my weakness. laughs> the same so we're supposed to make our weaknesses our strengths. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? I have learned to doubt that participation. Just because you'll let that student who comes in every day and raises their hand and says, I really liked the reading last night. It was exceptional. It was really, why did you like it? It was very clear. I really understood. You know, a waste of time. These participants who are doing it just because they know that they want to check it off the list for the grade. So I don't. I used to have them grade themselves with participation. I found that I was getting a lot of that, you know, because they felt like I got to raise my hand and say something, or it's not. So I like that you have these worded the way you did on these rubrics to say quality, you know, <laughs> importance, something that makes the class better, not just your opinion of the last night's reading. And I also just had read this article. Um, by a woman who was an at-home mom, and maybe you've seen it, um, the question that will kill your marriage, and the question that will kill your marriage is, how was your day? <laughs> because, you know, her husband would come home and she's like, how was my day? It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> there were moments that I cried with sheer joy, and moments that I was sitting in the car ready to drive away from his children. You know, you can't. So I'm trying to be very specific with my questions, not how was the reading or how did the interpretation go, but during the interpretation, how did you feel that your finger spelling improved from the lot? You know, something very specific. And that usually takes them off guard. And see, that still is an open ended question. Right. Because they're having to make that connection. I think about that. What did I do? But it's, it's harder for me. I mean, it's been a big challenge to come up with very specific questions for them. But once it opens up, 
they they say, well, yes, my finger's gone, but also I notice that my lag time, and they'll, they'll move into something else that is also important. But coming up with that one, the key, right? The key to open the door, because there's some days you cannot get that door open, no matter what you do. I think I did a car middle once. That was a really long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back to the classroom. How important is the dialogue amongst everyone in the class, knowing that there are serious extroverts and extreme introverts and everybody learns differently i i definitely want to hear everyone and offer time for those who are intimidated but see that's what i think about having new writers because i think i put my teaching philosophy something like what we can see and you can't always see that but when they're writing even if it's a paragraph sometimes i just say write a sentence Paragraph. So it's not extensive, I mean, but you can, from the ones that aren't sending me, you can tell they're sorry. Mm-hmm. Others. That was one of the reasons I quit doing participation class because I think it's it's not. I just think it's good. That's it. Also, the other thing you have is the students who dominate. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. That would be really nice. I just said. Back off a minute. It was her, somebody else. But, you know, they're very strong personalities. You know, we're not going to go there. <laughs> you have to be their brain. Usually, they're dominated because they have a lot to say. That really closes the door for other people. So, you want to say something? I'm going to for an education class at Penn State for a whole semester. And these are student teachers who really were on their way out to be, or they just got back, whatever class this was. And the one student would come in, and there's you know, 60, 80 people in this class, and the one professor, and the one girl who sat in the second row would sit down with the newspaper on her desk, and the minute he would start lecturing, she would crack that open and hold it up in front of her and read. And the guy just lectured and lectured, and finally, I said, it doesn't that bother you? How do you, why would you tell him to stop that? And he said, she has the most thoughtful writing of anyone in this entire classroom. (laughs) This is how she pays attention and I respect that and I'm not the type of teacher who demands that everyone look at me. I am not here to get them all like cattle to behave in the same way to learn. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I can do that. I'm taking cell phones away. (laughs) Oh, it's so strong. Yeah, that's really, that's, that's really wonderful. I'm just going to say another technique, and this is one I used a while back, but and this was with um, the old CLS when we read the Bill of Rights. I would have each of them for their pre writing or pre assignment was to pick of the Bill of Rights which three do they think are the most important. Or if you had to sacrifice, which group would you keep, you know? And then when they come in, I put them into twos, pairs. And the two people have to come to a consensus of what the top of the most important three are. And then I put the pairs together into fours, and the four people have to come to a consensus. And then you put the fours into eights. They really learn to argue. Yes, and they really learn, you know what I mean? And at the end, you know, you've got the whole class together, and we all have to come up to a kid, come with a kid. And we always end up with alternate, alternate. So, like, this is like plan A, plan B, and plan or whatever, but it really does get conversation going because people want their point to win, you know, ultimately. But I think it helps starting them out in pairs, it at least gives each person an opportunity to speak, you know, to just one other person. I think, uh, if you need to leave, uh, Chris wanted to say something. I have more. Well, I don't know if you can answer it. Um, my question is, well, we, you talk about that really strong personality. What do you do when you have somebody who has, who, who thinks they're a very strong personality and tries to make contributions, but what they're saying 
don't reflect the depth of thought and, and it kind of turns other students off from talking, especially the ones who who are hesitant to speak in the first place. So how, how can we think of that in, in a diplomatic way to not stop that person from talking when it's gathered, to also facilitate both the conversation with those who are hesitant to talk but don't want to respond to something that is sort of not really that thought provoking to begin? That's a really good uh, I, I think sometimes I've had students in the classroom who have done that, where they can do it or something for them to say, and it's not even related to what you're talking about. And I try to, to kind of take what they've said and bring it back to what we're talking about to kind of recenter the conversation. And, and sometimes it's, it's subtle and sometimes it's not so subtle. <laughs> but I think you just do the best you can do when that happens. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to do is bring it. Well, that's interesting, but how does, you know, what do you think about what we're talking about today? <laughs> you know, what do you think about the the class and explain? Because I think what we're talking is talking and not quite getting it and you know these are we're here to teach them how to succeed one student specifically had said this is what you're i wish i had this <laughs> so they say, this is what we're looking for and this is what you're saying and they're not the same so you're actually hurting your participation grade because you're using up a lot of class time to discuss things that aren't relevant to the class yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because well. once a week I have them bring in a news article about Congress that they can relate directly to the chapters that covered that. I'm enjoying this thing to go to the discussion. She teaches in the room next to me and I'm like, so what's this? She's not so far as But they have to think about how to apply what they've read in the text to something in the news. I've done that in the I've done that in the women's Bring in something that they like that affects the women's status. Did you see the newspapers? Or the international, when I did the comp, because I didn't ask them to part of the women's group, just the rest of the world. But I had them bring in something from that particular, an article from that particular country that reflects something about the culture of music connection. And that does, they have to think about what did this text say? That was a pretty good newspaper, which is a good thing. <laughs> Sometimes. And they have to find it. And they have to think about it. And I think they can do some questions. We did that one for the history class, so it was a bunch of stuff that happened like forever ago. And we did that to get into our newspaper database to find something who's going on in that particular place that still exists today. What's happening in Timbuktu today, or some obscure place along the Silk Road, what's happening in this music? They really were so shocked by that. It's still going on. It's a cool engine of terrible, you know. <laughs> Well, I've done this before. I've kind of done it a lot. Then we mentioned the mummy, excuse me, about the midterm. Because I'm using an anthology, and we're reading like three texts a day, three essays a day. And it's a literature the environment, and we're not a very environmentally focused campus or area of the world. So there's not just significant engagement with it. So they were worried about taking the attorney exam and how are they going to know all these authors and what are they going to have to learn? And some of the students that have had a course in the show, I just want you to know what quotes are and who the authors are. So I could just sense there was this huge unease. So I said, I'm going to do something that I haven't done in a few years. You're going to write the new term. And they all come forward to me. I was like, what? So what I did yesterday, I told them, each one, there's split into five chapters, and each chapter has a theme that the book helps with. It's pretty good in the chapter, so I'm going to come up with it. And I told them to pick three texts from each chapter that they felt 
best reflected at the end of that time. And they did this in groups of three. And then we put them on the board, and I listed them by chapter. And if two or three, we, we voted, we essentially voted on them. So if group one and group three both picked the same test, it had two votes. Well, we, almost every one of them had at least two that were the most votes. We need one more, so then we had to vote on it as a class. So they picked the test. For tomorrow, they have to bring in two questions for each one of the tests that are open-ended, critical thinking questions using those verbs that, that I showed you earlier. Then so I'll take them home. <laughs> And I'm going to give them the study questions. Those will be their study questions for the exam. And I'm going to give it to them. I'm probably sending it out over the weekend. Tuesday, we'll go over it in class. That will be the review. When I did this before, I did it actually in a freshman comp class a couple of years in a row. And I was amazed how well they were able to write the questions. 